Okay, let's get going. Um, first of all, thank you for everybody for joining. Uh, we'll pass on to our speakers in a moment, but uh, I'd like to welcome you to this, uh, this impact lecture from the National Center of Confidence and Research Digital Fabrication. Um, this is our lecture series, which focuses on the impact of, of architecture and innovation, uh, specifically impact in the areas of uh, social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Um, we format this lecture series um, partially as a presentation, but then partially also as, a, as an interview. So our interviewer for today is uh, Dr. Enna Loret Flitschi, and our speaker for the day is uh, Yasmin Lari. Um, I'm pleased to, to welcome them both. Uh, and for introductions, I'm first going to pass over to, to Enna. Enna, please go ahead. Yes, so of course, it's a great honor for me to have you here, Yasmin. We met already a couple of years back in Vienna, and I said we should definitely get you to the ETH, and now we managed to do so. So it's an honor to have you for the Impact Lecture, and I would like to say a few words about Yasmin. She's, in fact, a co-founder and a CEO of the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan. She's an architectural historian and a humanitarian architect as of now. She's also Pakistan's first female architect that graduated from Oxford Brokes University in 1963, after which she built several landmarks in Pakistan and is considered amongst the pioneers of brutalist architecture. What's, what makes her very special and why she's here today is that after she retired in 2000, she began engaging herself in heritage management and humanitarian architecture. Her work has brought several national and international awards. And in October 21, she was the first woman to be awarded with the honorary degree, Loria Magistrali ad Horem in architecture from the Politecnico in Milano. And here she was declared the architect for the poorest of the poor and recognized for her contribution and impact towards disaster resilient, zero carbon, sustainable and affordable housing. So I would really like to welcome you Yasmin, to show us your work, and we look much forward to hear more about your impactful work. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you so much, Anna, for that very kind introduction. So, uh, greetings from Pakistan, and thank you so much, uh, Rasel and uh, Anna and Aniko, for inviting me to present my case in your impact lecture series. Considering how different as the world where I, ha I hail from, from your world of high technology at the National Center of Competence for Digital Fabrication, where you are dealing with state-of-the-art processes and tools, here I am promoting low-impact techniques and commonly found materials to deal with social injustices in Global South, as well as to counteract environmental injustice and echo bigotry that is prevalent, I'm afraid, in the Global North. In today's world, when COVID-19 has blurred distinctions and equalized humanity, we need to devise strategies to counteract injustices that abound in all parts of the world. While some countries in the north of Europe, including perhaps Switzerland, may have been able to escape the economic crunch that has impacted others, we all have to work together to deal with inequalities and homelessness that has disturbed the equilibrium in most societies. We are all aware of the damage caused by colonial mindset to the Earth's ecosystem due to wasteful and highly consumptive ways of living and building. We also know that it is the global north where the capital system, systems have encouraged excessive exploitation of Earth's resources and need to implement immediate corrective measures. So I'll just start, try to start my, my presentation. If we wish to retrieve the tide, to reverse the tide, and save the planet from further misuse, the time has come to seek solutions found in countries in the global south, such as Pakistan, which has rich traditions based on a diversity of tangible and intangible uh, heritage, solutions that are based on local wisdom and vernacular techniques to fashion an equitable world, which is driven by both social and ecological justice. Now, a little bit about my organization, I don't know how, to, uh, why is it not moving forward? Yeah, all right, thanks. So uh, this is Heritage Foundation of Pakistan that Anna mentioned that was co-founded with my late husband, Suhail Zahiri Lari, an eminent historian and author due to which I could be engaged in heritage safeguarding 
and conservation from 1980 onwards. At the same time, my work with heritage and vernacular traditions helped me to devise strategies for the poor of the country. On the left, you see this amazing and then with Axis Jakasa, this amazing uh, uh, monument of 16th century, a tomb of Sultan Ibrahim, that Heritage Foundation has conserved at Makli World Heritage Site, the largest Muslim necropolis in the world, where the monuments present 400 years of diverse styles of architecture. And on the right is the reconstructed zero carbon earth masonry structure, one of thousands of structures that we helped build after countrywide floods in 2010. It is a not-for-profit social and cultural entrepreneur organization, as you can see, which has been established for safeguarding Pakistan's cultural heritage. But since 2005, when Pakistan was hit with this enormous earthquake, it provides humanitarian assistance by building heritage, uh, linking heritage for uh, in, in innovative socially and ecologically led initiatives. So a little bit more about uh, you know, where I come from with the diverse cultural heritage that exists in my country. So first of all, there's a mix of tangible, intangible, and vernacular heritage. And as you can see, there's we go back to Bronze Age Mohenjo-daro, which is about you know 2,600 BC, and Mehargarh. And then there's Hindu, Buddhist, and Gandhara, and Sikh monuments. A really diverse kind of range of kinds of buildings. And then the Sultan period of uh, sites and so on. And then Mughal palaces, forts, and paradisal gardens, which are just absolutely spectacular. And there's of course the British colonial period because we were subjugated for about 150 years. And then, as you see in the middle, is the intangible heritage, which is to do with Sufi traditions and spiritualism, is to do with folklore and folk traditions and oral history and diverse crafts. I mean, everybody, every woman, for instance, has this amazing, uh, you know, specialization of crafts. So there's just so much there. And then, of course, for me, what is very, very important is the vernacular heritage, because that's where you see how the materials are used, how you locally source them, how with the ease of building and economy and, and all kinds of things that are environmentally also extremely useful for us. So um, now let's move on what the challenges in my country are, and I think many in the world, many places in the world as well. There is, of course, the climate change, which is an overarching issue today everywhere. Global warming that is happening to each one of us, recurring disasters, and Pakistan is the fifth uh, most vulnerable country in the world today. And then there's uncontrolled greenhouse gas emissions everywhere. There are rising poverty levels, increasing disparities, unchecked population, and then, of course, there is COVID-19. So these are the different challenges I feel that we have to deal with. So as a result, there are estimated to be over 3 billion people around the world who require shelter and other basic facilities for survival alone. This vast population remains underserved or unserved today. Most of these, of course, belong to South Asia and uh, Sub-Sahara Africa. Thus, in my view, democratization of architecture and utilizing participatory approaches using locally sourced materials have become paramount. It is ironic that even though belonging to industrially developing world, only after I had been brought to close, uh, to brought, brought to close my own career as a star architect for 36 years, recurring disasters in Pakistan from 2005 forced my attention towards the vast marginalized sections in my country. So as a practicing architect, uh, barring a few projects, I also indulged in an extravagant ecodistic journey, which focused on serving the elite of my country. This is a building called Pakistan State Oil Head Office, and I designed it in early 1980s for the largest oil company in Pakistan that was listed in Fortune 500, with extravagant use of cement and steel, reflective, gla reflective glass and aluminum, um, you name it, it was all there. So um, and I thought I'd give you the focus, the other side of it. Because of widespread deficits and deprivations, particularly among women, for me, the pursuit for justice has been paramount. And the reason why I decided to design a stratagem called Barefoot Social Architecture, a baza, for the disadvantaged, I felt empathy with those who walked barefoot and had become my fellow travelers. While the notion of being barefoot may be strange for many living in more affluent societies such as yours, for me, barefoot is a common sight in our rural areas. It demonstrates the harshness of life, but it has its benefits also. You are able to tread softly on the earth and grow up using the planet's resources with care. It reminds that all of us have to learn to use the earth's resources judiciously. And so, um, barefoot social argument, what is it? 
Well, Baza is akin to social engineering for bringing about social change, incorporating environmental, cultural, and technical dimensions, resulting in transformations of mindset from a cycle of dependency to a culture of pride and self-reliance. On the one hand, Baza seeks to de democratize architecture that provides people with well-being and self-esteem. On the other, it unashamedly promotes zero carbon footprint structures using ubiquitous earth, conservatives, magic lime, and renewable bamboo. Now, if you look at the Baza impact, uh, you know, in about five, six years, you can see that it benefited about 0.84 million people. That's something like or, over 100,000 persons per year. Through our zero carbon rights-based development, it aims to achieve 12 out of 17 sustainable development goals or SDGs at an extremely low cost. And so uh, I just wanted to share with you the basic tenets of Baza. The first is, of course, maximizing the potential of existing barefoot ecosystem, applying three zeros, zero cost to donors, zero carbon and zero waste methodologies, leading to zero poverty, which is goal number one in SDGs, as you know. And secondly, focus on social and ecological justice through humanistic architecture, fostering pride, dignity, and well-being and preventing depletion of the planet's resources. Thirdly, delivery of unmet needs. There are so many of them that people don't have. The poor people just do not have them. And there's a barefoot incubator for social good and environmental sustainability for training in self-building or co-building at affordable uh, products for unmet needs of BOP, which is the bottom of the pyramid, which is the poorest of the poor. And then of course, fourthly is the non-engineered structures for shrinking ecological footprint using green skills and sustainable locally sourced materials. So working with marginalized communities in the last years has allowed me to adopt a bottoms up approach, encouraging efficient use of funds and resources, rights-based development, knowledge sharing through training and guidance for cost-effective uh, outputs. This is in turn has stimulated the barefoot ecosystem that I talked about in order to foster a life of reasonable fulfillment through an enabling process of serving and sharing with the other disadvantaged people. So what the poor people make, they, they, they actually market it to the other poor and that's how the chain starts. So here we are, Baza Tenet 1, maximizing barefoot ecosystem. And I just thought I'd just show you the other different segments, the barefoot economy, there's barefoot market, there's barefoot enterprises, uh, barefoot entrepreneurs, uh, barefoot skills, and even barefoot products, which are affordable items fabricated using eco recycled techniques and materials to improve the quality of life of the marginalized. And uh, uh, among the reasons for Baza outreach really have been the maximization of the barefoot ecosystem, which is, you know, as is vast. In many countries, it comes to about 50 to 70% of the population. So uh, this is what it should be in order to create zero carbon humanistic architecture, which fosters pride and well being and dignity. Now, for this, I follow two gurus who I wanted to share with you. Sorry, so this is really a, a graphic of the same thing as to what the ecosystem consists of. And so here is my first guru, 20th century uh, architect, um, Hassan Fatehi, the earth guru, author of Architecture for the Poor, who taught me the value of engaging the people to unleash their creativity, like co-building and, and, and uh, co-design and co-creating. And then, of course, there's the great uh, lime guru, Marcus Vitruvius, that you know all about, uh, first century BC Roman, uh, Roman architect, and from whom I learned the use of lime as well as the importance of air, water, earth, and fire. Four elements, the alchemy of which leads us to democratic norms and behavior. And then I just wanted to share with you as to what my palette is. So there's earth, lime, and bamboo. And uh, uh, these I've used for over a decade now to achieve carbon neutral structures. Uh, in this slide, you can see the attributes of each material. I mean, earth, all of them I buy. Are degradable. All of them are, you know, really sort of have little or zero carbon emissions. And as you know, uh, lime and bamboo actually absorb air, uh, absorb carbon from the air. And of course, earth is totally benign. So there are just these these three element, elements or three materials that can really give you a, a whole range of kind of building activity that probably is not possible with any, many other materials. So and then of course there's a uh, Baza Tenet 2, which focuses on social and ecological justice through humanistic architecture. 
And uh, uh, then again, if you see, I just wanted to share with you some of the examples and to again, see how uh, low impact techniques can be used, which were used traditionally to be used today for making climate resilient structures and, uh, and also carbon neutral structures. So uh, you can see the on the left is, the, is a, a survival uh, building from the floods of 2010 and there's bamboo and thatch roof, which is anchored. Uh, and then, you know, the same thing is, is uh, applied to a new structure, which has got uh, really earth masonry walls and, and a bamboo roof, uh, which, is, uh, which breathes. And so it is really very, very comfortable. It creates a microclimate of its own. And uh, then if you go to the next one, this is another one which I call the improved vernacular uh, kind of construction. And you see on the left is a structure that survived the 2005 earthquake, which has this cross bracing of wood, which is very common in I think old sort of uh, old uh, construction in, in many countries in Europe as well. And as you can see, this was replaced by us when we started first using bamboo. So this is a bamboo structure, but using, sorry, using the same uh, technique of cross bracing, which is called hiji. And uh, uh, this again, it says, uh, you know, it's, it's a very resilient structure, very low cost, and it doesn't use any, any kind of uh, wood at all. And then this is a structure which is uh, for areas where this constant flood is also entirely bamboo. And this was done by, actually the animation was done by Al Jazeera uh, uh, TV channel. And uh, you can see this, how uh, when the floods rise, uh, the stilts, the bamboo stills actually provide the protection. And this is the whole thing with very, very low impact materials, you can actually achieve a very good results. Uh, so now we come to Baza uh, tenet number three, which is delivery of unmet needs through sustainable locally sourced materials and training, because I think the focus is on training and you will understand because this is what you do. You are training people to do, to do excellent work, to be able to do it in a manner that makes, it, makes a difference. And this is what it has to be. Now we have to focus on training of the poor as well, not just on the ones that are privileged. And that's something so important. I feel really deeply about this because I think just giving out largesse and giving out charity is not helping. We've got to do it in a manner that may, we make them self-reliant uh, by teaching them how to, how to actually build things so that they can counteract all kinds of, uh, all kinds of disasters. So you see on the left, uh, uh, 30,000 uh, rupees is something like oh, 150, uh, 150 euros less, in fact, uh, to make one room. This is a, a prefabricated bamboo uh, panel room, which is then treated with lime and, and mud. And on the right, you see a, a zero, zero waste um, uh, and zero carbon kind of toilet as well. These are basic needs of the people. This is the, uh, the Pakistan Tula stove, uh, which has become very famous now because of the beautiful decoration done by women. And uh, it is smokeless and has lots of many different, very wonderful attributes, which has elevated their lives, uh, the lives of women you know, and, uh, completely. And it was very lucky, we, uh, it got a, a World Habitat Award, the UN World Habitat uh, Trophy. And it was brought to Pakistan, given to our president, uh, His Excellency, um, you know, president of Pakistan, who then handed it to me and I handed it over to the icon, the, the, the stove icon who's you know, wrapped in a sari on the left at another, uh, another uh, chula uh, that you know, women are making, something like 70,000 of these have been built. And uh, uh, this lady here, she earns something like the one that you can see in this picture. He, she earns something like 25 times what she used to earn five years ago. So where she would be, uh, you know, maybe now five years ago or over now she earns 600 euros per month as compared to only 25 euros uh, she earned only some years ago. So then how do we get to these unmet needs? We just train a huge number of people. And this is a mendicant, a beggar community that's been taught for many, uh, you know, for about a month and then we handhold them. And this is all part of the incubator that, that does this. And then they go around, make products and sell them. And something like 70% of about 230 rose above the poverty line just before uh, COVID struck last year. A lot of women doing this and they're just amazing what they do. And then I have the Bazaar Tenet 4, uh, which is the last one, which is non-engineered structures for sharing, uh, for shrinking the ecological footprint using green kind of materials, locally sourced materials. And uh, I just wanted to share some of them, but also to let you know that I'm sure that you're aware that what is the environmental impact of construction as it is today? And these are UNEP figures, 40% of world energy is used, 16% of world water usage, 
3 billion tons of raw material and 15 to 20% of waste stream. This is what we are doing uh, to damage the planet. All of us who are involved in building uh, industry in one way or the other, or in the, in, in the building environment. And then you can see the energy requirement of steel and uh, 1600 to 1800 C, Portland cement, uh, 1450 to 1550, and ceramic, ceramic brick and so on. So we know that this is really, really damaging the, the earth. And then we have these international models that are very, very expensive. I mean, this is like uh, 750 euros um, on the left here. Uh, and uh, one uh, uh, consultant who worked out this particular figure found that for 100, uh, if you were to build 100 of uh, such units with the burnt brick, you would have deduded 50,000, over 50,000 acres of, of forest, which is, I mean, we can't afford to do this at all. So why are we using, uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, burnt brick when lime earth brick is equally stable, equally strong, and does very well in terms of deflecting water? And then, um, this is something that I did that we started off in the after the floods, uh, uh, which is you know the largest world's largest zero carbon shelter program in the world. Uh, Forty thousand shelters were built just with the uh, IOM, which is the uh, uh, which is the organization for migration. And then uh, no carbon emissions, no trees were felled. Seventeen hundred fifty villages were covered. Two hundred persons were housed. And locally sourced clay, low energy lime, and renewable bamboo are all that we used. So there we are. This can be done. And then I just want to show you some more pictures of how they looked. And this is all co-building by people themselves. There, yeah, but this is all earth and earth walls and bamboo roofs. And then uh, how they decorate them. That's another story. Then because this is their own, they they really start taking pride in it, and it gives them something that they you know their aspirations are met and and so on. There's so much there with the materials that are locally available that have been traditionally used, we need to see how we can work with them to be able to reach out to the maximum number of people. This is something that I've designed in the last years and this was done actually for an earthquake area, earthquake area, which is a bamboo prefabricated panel, which is uh, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, can, can be really put together under, under supervision so it can be really controlled and then eight of them form a room, which is about uh, uh, 12 feet, which may be about, what, is it about three, a little over? I guess three three meters, and then if you put two more panels, you can make it into a larger room uh, for a school uh, classroom, for instance. Or uh, again, if you add on maybe another four panels, then you make another big octagon, and you can now we know how to make domes now. So you make this very nice cupola, which just adds on another dimension to the whole structure. It's all bamboo. It's all just bamboo. And then you can add on, you know, a couple more uh, of the same modules. And when you do that, then you know you get a whole complete, um, uh, complete community center with verandas and so on. So this is just can be done by very, very, you know, very low scale people. Just teach them, and they just go and do it. And you can see what it looks like. This is the Interbau Center that we built in Muckley. And uh, this was actually supported by His Royal Highness Prince Charles, uh, Prince of Wales of England, and because he's a great, great supporter of, of zero carbon work. And uh, it's all thatch and, and bamboo and, and mud. And then this is a big trading center. It's called the Zero Carbon uh, Center, uh, Cultural Center, ZC3. It's become quite well known now, actually, as it happens, because this is all just bamboo as well. It's big marquee. And just wanted to show you this inside. There's a huge space where we use for training of different kinds of people. And then similarly, uh, you know, we have international conferences there, so you can see how many people can be there. And it's an amazing, uh, you know, structure and a, and, a, and a place where you could be because it's all open. So the breezes go through, it's cool. It doesn't require any energy for it, for, for it to be comfortable. And it's very enjoyable because you, you just, you know, feel nature while you're inside it. So it really is as part of that. And uh, I just wanted to show you this because everybody thought since I'm only building in rural areas, it will have no application to urban centers. So you design this and hopefully to build it, which is an incremental bamboo structure, which is again, based on the same, uh, you know, uh, prefabricated bamboo panel put together and you can you know start with one single story and carry on and add on and so you know it will be equally useful for for urban centers and just wanted to show you that when we had this conference and we got a lot of eminent uh, experts who came in from all over the world and they they were then learning from these uh, you know low skilled artisans who were really experienced and knew how to use earth and lime and so on and so forth and they learned from them and i think it was a good experience i think maybe it's a good idea for a lot of people to do that. And then I just wanted to also share with you that we put in about 24 
videos uh, of how to how to make these things as, as a training program for everybody so it's it's uh, open source it's on youtube and people then are open them on their on their basically on their cell phones and they're able to build these structures because that may that means that you improve the quality of construction across the board it doesn't matter whether you have access to anything or not whether you're educated or not whether you're poor or you're rich you can all do the same thing and that's what's important we've got to get the best practices into the hands of everybody to be able to make sure Sure, that they have, they are they are able to withstand any kind of disasters. You see on the left, Politecnico di Milano, amazing uh, uh, Dean Elaria and and uh, Professor uh, you know Cassandra and her whole team and seventeen students put this together in their campus at the Politecnico di Milano. I was just there recently, as uh, you know, and I has just mentioned. And then this is cell building in Pakistan in the middle, and there's something going on in Malawi also just based on the tutorial. So it's possible to reach out with technology today. So uh, then I wanted to show you, this is done in Islamabad. Uh, I showed you earlier the rural uh, version, and now you can see this is done in a highly sophisticated, uh, you know, capital of Pakistan, uh, 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 an urban center, and architects and, and uh, students, something like 75 of them have put this together. And so I'm, I'm very happy that this is all catching on. And then I just wanted to actually, this is my last uh, bit in that, is I wanted to show you how with just very low um, uh, uh, low impact materials locally available, this is just mud, mud walls and bamboo uh, kind of inserts uh, that gives you a totally uh, water uh, earthquake uh, structure. And I just show you how we put it together very quickly. It's an animation to show how you have lime concrete foundations. So of course you do that usual. And then you have this bamboo lattice that you put in in between layers of your masonry at every you know one meter or so, and then uh, as you get to the top, you again and you, you have your lintel, which are also bamboo. You have a lime co concrete uh, layer, and then you put in again uh, the same thing, and also on top of it, you have these um, uh, these uh, ring beams, which are uh, lime concrete, but also they're reinforced with bamboo, and then are normal. Uh, bamboo joists and finishing of it with porcelana and so on. And then you get, and then you line it again with lots of bamboo uh, lattice from inside and out, and it makes a totally resilient structure. And I wanted to show you why, uh, uh, sorry. And it, this is now, we did a testing because nobody would believe this would happen. I said it'll collapse. So uh, we did this shaking table test in a very, you know, really reputed university in Karachi called NED. And the model was scaled down to 50% of actual size. Then it was subjected sequentially to ground motions corresponding to Kobe earthquake. If you remember, it was a massive earthquake, uh, which was 7.3 Richter scale. And then levels that were applied were first 25%, 50%, and so on to 100% nothing happened to it and then of course uh, again it went out to 125 250 again to 275 percent and no cracks appeared and then the vice chancellor was most unhappy and he said we've got to somehow make it collapse so they went on to 670 uh, uh, movements of, of kobe earthquake the walls got damaged but collapse did not happen and i'll just show you this is the last one where, where you can see how uh it was worked out how how what actually did happen here sorry this moment i didn't start it oops yeah okay so you bear with me for a moment yeah that's it this is 100 percent of kobe earthquake it's happening now kobe earthquake, right you can see nothing can happen to it's just exactly the same not a crack not any so then uh, we went on to 125 150 175 and so on and so forth and uh, we now come to 275% uh, of some uh, point. And now you can see, this is 275%, almost three times of COVID. Uh, and, and you can see, nothing. It's fine, it's resilient, it moves. No problem you know, at all. And so then, of course, that is when the professor thought it really got to be collapsed, so 670%. And you can see uh, these are really severe jokes, and uh, uh, we weren't sure how long it will last or what will happen to it. Uh, and I really thought the pool will also collapse, but you can see that uh, it will survive. So this life safety, whatever it does, even if it didn't collapse, but even if it did, it is so light that nothing would happen. And also, if you can see, 
it can all be fixed, it can all be repaired again, it's just one in line. And there we are, this is, the, this is what can be done with these very low impact materials. And so uh, just to leave a thought with you, use the three zeros, zero cost, zero carbon, and zero waste for saving the planet and the destitute of the world. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. See if I can stop my presentation. Okay, that's it. Thank you, thank you, Ina. So, thank you very, very much, Yasmin, for this impressive talk and lecture, showing us your work. Thank you for um, your faith in me. <laughs> so, what? I said, thank you for your faith in me uh, and inviting me after that. Yeah, uh, no, it's really, it's yeah, an honor to have you here that. very much. I, while, while watching your lecture, of course, I cannot stop thinking about how is the flow of economy because you make these buildings for the poorest of the poor right but of course they need the bamboo they need the materials there need to be people coming together how how is this initiated how is this sort of made because these are let's say seemingly prototypes that you show us but how do the people actually afford to make their own house is it for a special amount of people or is it donated? I, there I'm a bit unknowledgeable how this is working. Okay, uh, very good question. And very, it, it requires a very comprehensive answer because there are lots of issues that you've raised here. Uh, of course, as you must know uh, that there are different levels of poverty. Uh, some are really, really poor who can't do anything except unless you really you know, give them something to start off with. Uh, then of course, there are other levels where they have a little bit of money and they can actually muster you know, material from around themselves. Uh, thirdly, of course, the issue always is uh, who will do it? Now, what we what we found with our tutorials, we are also running some uh, uh, training programs for artisans now from the same village. So what we are doing is this, we are saying, okay, you come over, we'll train you. So they learn how to make the bamboo structures, how to assemble them, put them together. And then they go back. Now, some are starting, some are being supported by NGOs where they are giving them the basic materials. But I think the trick is that it's all very low cost. So it is affordable. And apart from the basic bamboo structure, which requires some investment in the beginning, everything is like locally sourced whether it is thatch, whether it's in the roof, the grass for the roof, whether it's plaster that they have to do this all locally, they, they put in their own effort into it. So it is really truly co-building where they may get some help where the poorest of the poor, but beyond that, they do it themselves. And that's the whole thing. If you really want to reach the masses, you know, all this funding that comes to all our countries from, I don't know, from uh, EU, from UK and from USA and God knows where, uh, it's not needed actually. What is needed is very little amount of money that will just get, keep them afloat and then they help themselves to do it. So at a very fraction of the cost of normal construction, it can be done. It's not a problem and we've seen it happening now and the, and the mm -hmm. products they're making, they're selling and they're making money. There is a huge market as long as the prices are low and it's, it should be affordable, but also good quality. I mean, that I always emphasize, you have to have good design for the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. You can't just treat them like as if they are nothing, you know, I mean, they have to be treated like I, I try to treat them like I did my corporate clients. I mean, they are mm -hmm. as important to me. So th I think that's where we have to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But so, so that brings me a bit to the next where, because you say they, they build up their own markets, they become specialist in a certain, so, so they specialize themselves. Some people specialize themselves in making tiles, others in the bamboo. And then you have the reuse of materials that you emphasize on also in the end, where you show the, the, the building that was put on, on the test bed for, for earthquake. So, so how is this whole ecology of the reuse of materials? I know from previous talks that we've had that, you actually also source material from buildings that have been demolished. So how is this whole ecosystem working? And how is it, is it really, is it really working to be honest in my question or is it more a nice to have? 
Yes. Um, uh, you know, um, I, nobody believed in this. I, even I did not know whether it will happen, OK? So uh, when we started, it was really, you know, we were just trying to test waters. How, how can we manage it? And uh, uh, but once uh, there was uh, no money left with the some international organizations, that's where I got a chance to be able to do it, because then everybody was looking for solutions that would be really low cost. So this massive building, I mean, 40,000, 50,000 ready to date now we built. It's not a small number, but it's really not enough. And uh, 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 but it's all based on on materials that are really available, like uh, Earth is around them. And uh, if there's any repairs needed, they can do it. Like sometimes, you know, where we built, um, uh, where there's too much flooding, then uh, the, the the plaster gets eroded, but that can be repaired from just around there. So most of the materials are existing. The only material that has to be, that has some embodied energy that it's got to be brought in from, uh, you know, maybe a couple of hundred uh, kilometers or something like bamboo, it's not available in every, I mean, it's not available right next door, but it's close. And so uh, that is the only one, but that structure is so strong that if you know you have to maybe move somewhere, you can just dismantle it and take it with you. So everything that is there, I mean, there's in terms of circular economy, in terms of seeing that you know we are really using, uh, reusing, and and, uh, and 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 you know uh, sort of making them last longer. This is all happening here, and uh, and uh, it's just. Uh, it can be scaled up if, if uh, what I need today is, uh, I think I'm reaching out to people quite nicely now with the videos, everybody's downloading and looking. What I need is really um, a very kind of a low interest, uh, low kind of micro loans for people. If somehow those could be arranged and people are now ready to be trained, they're ready to really deliver. And we can scale up the whole thing to hundreds of thousands, not a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it brings me to the next. So, so because you already kind of hint towards this, no, we can scale it up. Where, where do you see, because you worked really as an ordinary architect before. And of course, the environment where you are building is an environment where less is needed for shelter in comparison to, let's say, Northern Europe. We cannot live in open door houses. It's, we will freeze to death. So, so, where, where do you think we can start to, because there is, there is the buzzword at the moment going on, urban mining, and it's everywhere in, in Europe also. Do you see a, a correlation there? Do you see how you, let's say you would be an architect again and you would be in practice. Where do you see the impact of the work that you are doing? How do you think we could actually start to build and reuse materials in the way you're doing it now, do you think we can do it even, or is it a naive thought? Of course, uh, every time you design something, it is according to the context. Everything, I mean, this is what we do all the time, right? So I can't say I can, I can transpose something from here to your conditions, obviously not. But I think there are parallels, there are principles that I think we could all share. Uh, one is that, as you said about urban mining, uh, of course, there, there can be many ways of doing this. For instance, there is homelessness now in your countries as well, many of European countries, as well as in, in, in the US, from what I know, and I've seen it. And uh, there are lots of times there are vacant buildings lying there. So why is it that using the materials that are available, that you could not do low impact kind of partitions within that and provide housing for the people who are homeless. I mean, see, I think the architects have to now, or designers and people who are working have to change the way they are thinking. They have to go and find projects to do. You cannot be waiting for commissions to come. You cannot be waiting for somebody to tell you, come and do this for me, because there is the, the, the requirement is far greater now with all the economic, uh, you know, crunch that's happening with COVID-19 and all the rest of it. So I think we all have to put together, put our heads together. I would very much like, for instance, people like yourselves are so, so competent and highly kind of, uh, you know, highly qualified to maybe work with materials like Earth and see how that can be used. I mean, lime and Earth is a very good combination. How those could be used for making, uh, uh, just lowering the carbon footprint. Even if you're forced to use your concrete and steel uh, frames or whatever it has got to be done, 
uh, why is it that internally everything can't be low carbon? So you do a hybrid structure of, of just, just reduce the carbon footprint somehow. And I think the application is everywhere. Another one I think is, I think people everywhere in the world want more control over what they do. And some of architects were to change their mind and say, okay, let's work together with people and see how much are they willing to put in and how much should we put in? And can we facilitate that? I think that will make a lot of difference, especially people who are on the margins, who are not uh, wealthy, who don't have all the means. So I think there's a whole need now for us to see how we can change the profession into something different. You know, it can't go on like this. I don't feel, I don't think young architects have any chance to really go on and put, putting up the mega structures that some of us had the chance with, you know? I don't think it's going to happen in the next years. So um, I, I think we, we should all be working together on this, I feel, you know, then we can, maybe we can find solutions together. I think this is a great statement. Architects cannot go out and be star architects anymore. And with this, I would like to open up to the rest of the audience. I'm pretty sure there are others that have questions or comments to your talk. So please, whoever would like to go first. Yeah, please. <laughs> Nobody dares. <laughs> uh, maybe I will. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> so thank you very much for a, a great talk. Um, so I'm a um, professor of building materials at ETH. Um, I think the, the use of lime is a, is a, great, uh, it's a great material. Um, however, um, I mean, it does absorb CO2, but it first emits it when you produce it. So okay. the net balance, the net balance is, is emissions of CO2. And um, I think there um, comes a bit a question of uh, the economy of scale in productions. So you also talked about low energy CO2. Is that like industri industrial scale produce production of lime to make it efficient? Or uh, what's, your, what's your criteria for low um, energy CO2 would be a first question. Uh, no, that's a good question. You're absolutely right in what you say because lime has this cycle where it does, you know, it does uh, emit carbon and then finally starts absorbing it. And in Pakistan, actually, we uh, the way it is, uh, uh, the way it's produced is is uh, it doesn't require much of much of uh, energy at all. Actually, we're done in very kind of uh, low fired kilns. And so here, of course, and it's not done on a very large scale, obviously, it's done on smaller scales. But I agree with you, but when you go in for larger scale ones, then you have to be careful as to how you do it. But you know, the, the technology is now so advanced that we can now work out ways by which we somehow lower the, the, the carbon emissions. And I think if, if people put their mind to it, they can do it. And uh, uh, right now, nobody's even looking at lime because they think cement is the, is, you know, is, is the panacea for all ills. And there were the Romans who did it. We know that there were the Egyptians who did it. We know that I know that in my 15th, 14th, 15th century, um, our forefathers did it. And so it's a material that is available and it can be used. And so I agree with you, but I think the industry has to join hands with, uh, with designers and with, with people who are involved in built environment to see how we can lower the carbon footprint. And we must so, do so, that. So an interesting um, note maybe is, um, the largest amount of lime produced today goes into the steel uh, manufacturing um, and they are trying to reduce their CO2 emissions so they're going to ways where they won't be using lime uh, to treat the, um, the molten steel and this leaves probably um, the producers of lime kilns with a search for a, a new business. Mm. Um, and maybe yeah, we, I would be happy to, I can discuss maybe a bit more about that, but um, I think that this could be a, a new opportunity for, um, for a sector that, that sees problems on the horizon. What a wonderful suggestion. I mean, please, I mean, I think you are the people who will find all the solutions then, you know, and we must encourage more use of lime because there's definitely, I mean, cement, uh, the emissions from cement are just horrendous, you know? 
So whatever there is, I think I, I think all our effort has to be on lowering the carbon footprint. I mean, if you're talking of 1.5 uh, 1 uh, centigrade degree centigrade, uh, limiting uh, you know a, a, a sort of a rise in temperature as the you know the Paris Agreement and recently again ratified by COP26, then we all have to work towards that as to how do we start lowering wherever we are and however we can make it. So so that's a great suggestion. I think maybe. You know, and maybe it should be taken up seriously, you know, somehow promoted. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have more questions in the round or comments or Russell, go ahead. Yes, uh, Miss Larry, thank you very much for the, the, the wonderful talk. Um, I think uh, I'd like to try to make the bridge between what you've presented and, and what, uh, what our groups are, are working on. Um, as you know, probably from your talks with Ana, the, uh, the NCCR deals really as a developing nation in developing advanced technologies that are on the, the horizon line of, of technology. And I'm wondering whether um, you have any views on the advanced technologies that are being developed here or elsewhere and, and lessons that you might bring to us and at the same time, things that we are doing that might be useful to you and whether you see bridges between the extreme high tech and your very vernacular tech uh, approaches to architecture. I think that's a, yeah, that's a wonderful question, Russell, because I've been really reflecting on that as to what we can do. Because in today's world, I think we've got to create these bridges that you're talking about. Unless we do that, then, you know, I mean, now no country or no nation can work in isolation. And certainly there has to be a greater dialogue between uh, the global north and global south, but there's that much, much that can, we can share with each other. And uh, that's why I'm just delighted that you asked me to come here because I think, you know, what I know about what the, I remember the presentation that Ina made at, in, in Vienna at the uh, Vienna Biennale. And uh, of course you have such high tech facilities and you are so much involved in creating uh, so much really good work and uh, uh, but somehow it, it does it it doesn't have any application to my world, for instance. So if there could be a kind of a combination and we could work together in that, that would be really something amazing. And uh, uh, you know, as far as the low impact work is concerned, I'm quite willing to uh, uh, do any experimentation that you would like because my life is now committed to this kind of work. And uh, we have lots of uh, students coming in who do, uh, with whom we conduct workshops at Makli. And now that, um, I mean, with uh, uh, Politecnico di Milano, and then there's, uh, of course, uh, uh, in Vienna and other places where we are talking to see how we can bring in more students to, uh, to my world and to see what can be done there and then take back. I mean, there has to be more of this cross cross uh, interaction uh, between ourselves and then we'll be able to find something that will be worthwhile for, for you know for yourselves and ourselves both because now we have to work at both the worlds we can't you know keep them in isolation so wonderful I, i'm i'm game if russell would like anything to be done surely yes well, we'll have we'll have to discuss that for the future i think one of the the take homes that i have um, from your presentation is how important education, training, and, uh, and communication is in the disperance of your, of your, of your technologies to, to people. And that um, I think this is something that perhaps we can also do a bit better as well, is just communicating and uh, not just telling how to do things, but uh, making sure that the message of why we're doing things in the way that we're doing it is, is communicated strongly. Yes. And you know what's happening is that with this, uh, with technology, suddenly you know, with COVID-19, uh, Zoom and other, uh, you know, these means have become so prevalent and available and with, uh, you know, the, uh, with internet and, and uh, fast sort of communication, now everywhere we could get to everybody. And, you know, recently when we launched this program uh, with Interbao Pakistan to uh, carry out this work in different campuses in, in uh, in Pakistan, in the universities, uh, they wanted more help. So we conducted a program which it said, okay, step by step, live, 
We'll do something and you follow. We'll do something and they did it. And that made such a difference. And uh, in fact, there's a program now with British Council and with WOW, which is Women of the World, where we are now going to be training women. And there's a program now going on, on my, based on my tutorials in Bangladesh. And we're hoping to take our trained people from Pakistan and Bangladesh to the UK. And hopefully in March, we'll build it right there in London, something like that. So in Milano, of course, they did it amazingly well. The, the students were just incredible what they did. So um, I think there's a lot with technology that we can all work together and do that, you know, and, and, and this is what we need now. You see, the more knowledge we can share with each other, and to see how everybody can, can be part of everything rather than isolated. I think that's what is needed in the world today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yasmin, I think it's not the last time we are going to meet. <laughs> I hope not. And I, I'm just as no, excited. You will come to Pakistan. I, I, I would love to come. come. <laughs> <laughs> and we can make it virtual, but we should also make it real. And I, yeah. I think it this, nice. this has built up a nice platform where people yeah. have seen your work. I think there is plenty of opportunities to, to look for ways to bridge the work we are doing here. We discussed yeah. it back then in Vienna. How can we actually bring the knowledge, and I mentioned to you also Robert Flat back then, the knowledge that is here to Pakistan and vice versa. And I, I hope that, that this impact lecture maybe tickles something in all of us and that we can get together again and talk, uh, let's say, what could be the next Thank steps so or what could be a small you. project that we do together. It would be a very great opportunity. So in general, I, yeah. I don't know if there are other questions uh, in the work uh, that somebody would like to. Oh, Daniela, Daniel, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you again, uh, Yasmin Lai, for the for the good talk. Hello. Um, so one thing, as you're saying this, Anna, um, what comes to mind is if we have some type of augmented reality app. Sorry, say it again. So we, uh, so I represent uh, Design Plus Plus. It's a new center for augmented computational design mm -hmm. for architecture, engineering, and construction. So one mm -hmm. of the main uh, pillars which we focus on is uh, digital tools uh, to assist construction processes. So one thing which comes to mind is if there is a process to digitize and bring in these models which you have already developed and help support the construction process on site. So there are some interesting tools that already exist that are on smartphones. Oh, that's really yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the first idea that comes to mind uh, from this talk. So um, yeah. I think that could be quite interesting to even have as a proof of concept. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that. And I love this can be done. That'd be wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know? Because everything that we do, which helps uh, to further this, I mean, that's something that should be taken up. And uh, you are the experts, all of you in, in, in technology and, and using it in the way that the best possible way. So uh, that kind of contribution will be amazing. You know, it'll be just wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that suggestion. Yes. Very nice. Do we have more cool suggestions for collaborations <laughs> and how to bridge between two worlds? Petros, your work could also be very helpful. <laughs> yeah. okay. Exactly. So I would say let's, if no more questions are there, we should not take any more of your precious time, Yasmin. Thank you. For now, and I hope we can stay in touch. And um, it's been really a pleasure to have you. I think you. it's been a wonderful lecture, and it's been wonderful to have you speaking and having your opinion. And with this, I would like to say thank you uh, to everyone, and thank you for joining in for the lecture. And um, have yes. a nice afternoon. <laughs>